Somebody shout, it is so, it is so, come on, it is so. It is so, it is so. It is so. Somebody say, it is so. Let the church say, amen. Let the church say, amen. Let the church say, Lay your hand on the neighbor and say, neighbor, it is so. Let the church say, let the church say, let the church say, lift your right hand and say, oh, it will happen. Let the church say, Amen. Let the church say, Amen. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. Well, bless the law. Amen. Bless the law. Clap your hands and bless the law. Our God is amazing, and I love him so. Amen. But I can't love God unless I love you. Amen. So, so my expression of love commands first, Sister Sheru, that I love you. Then I can testify that I love God. Dare not testify of loving God, and you do not love your brother or your sister. So I thank God for the love of God that rests in my heart. Grateful for our beloved church mother. Amen. <laughs> to all of the saints of the Lord, Brother Darrell, glad to see you. Amen. My dear brother in the balcony, welcome to the Isle of Amor Church. Good to see you. Amen. Good to see you. So, uh, Deacon Newman, Deacon? I wanted to thank Deacon Newman. Amen. Um, for pretty, painting uh, the prayer chapel for us. So we got, got that done. We can finish our construction in there. And then hang our overflow or TV there and do some new lighting. We're getting ready to start the projects that begin uh, to lift the infrastructure. We're just about at the end of our depreciation of things. So it's time to paint and do some work in bathrooms and just to, Bring things up a notch. Amen. This is the house of God. This is the house of God. And when you are managing the house of God, there are regiments that are required to maintaining it and give it, giving it a distinction from any other house. So if I leave a hole in the wall in my house, I would not dare leave a hole in the wall in God's house because this is where God dwells. This is the Lord's house. So we thank God for his goodness and his mercy. Amen. Uh, special appreciation to Lady Sproul and the team of women who are working so hard in ministry. I understand that Ministry Wives was an amazing session on yesterday. Amen. And we thank God for that. And uh, the fly session last week I heard was off the hook. I, I heard it was off the hook. <laughs> And I understand that um, Sister Pat was an amazing contribution yesterday to the elders, ministers, and deacons' wives. They're coming together and they're building each other up. Amen. Amen. So, and in that diverse group, you have different experiences, aged women. Amen. And I heard she ministered to so many yesterday that helped them to understand the sacrifice of being married to a man who also is maybe a great husband, but also serves in the kingdom. It calls for a sacrifice. Without the joyful sacrifice, it will cre create matrimonial conflict. If the, each of you do not understand the need to affirm and to undergird the 
the understanding of kingdom sacrifice. Men of God are always in the house of God. Always in the house of God because it's in their heart when God gives you that burden. Amen. And it takes special ladies. It takes special women to be married to men who have a heart like that. But it is sacrifice. It is sacrifice. And sometimes it can be conflicting sacrifice. Sometimes it makes no sense. So the contention sometimes is justified in our mind. But the seeds of those sacrifices are far-reaching. They reach to your children and to your children's children. Amen. To advance the kingdom of God. So uh, we're having the big discussions. Amen. And we're helping each other grow into what God would have us to be. So I want to encourage the women's ministry to keep building. Amen. To keep working. I'm getting ready to start a millennial fire. Amen. And I need this generation so desperately, amen, to embrace the fullness of Christ and the mission that God has for them. So we're getting ready to build our infrastructure, time to empower our infrastructure, time to put it together, amen, so that we can do great ministry, amen, and to advance the will of the Lord. I am not counting. That's not my concern, amen. I am concerned about the effectiveness of ministry that actually gives God the glory, where we find the perfection in our function. Yeah, where we don't talk about one another, where we build up one another, where we make things happen to the glory and the honor of God. We love people who are hard to love. Yeah, some people hard to love. I wish I had somebody to say something to me. But the Christ in you says you got to love them. I wish I had a witness up in here. They make it hard for you to even say something nice to them. But the love of Christ will say, speak. Speak right now. You better speak. I'm going to wear you out. <laughs> I don't care if they don't speak back. You speak. Anybody here got the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost has made me speak to a lot of people I wanted to punch. <laughs> said, speak to them. <laughs> I said, do I have to, Jesus? He said, speak to them right now. Man of God, speak to, <laughs> speak to him right now. Woman of God, speak. And thank God. And that's the perfection of function, amen, that moves the church in the direction that gives God glory. Somebody say amen. 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 So the ministry calendars will be prepared uh, probably this week. You should get them by the weekend. Look for them in the email and some cards so we'll know what we're doing all year. It's time to come together. And I've been limiting, limiting the church fellowships, a lot of these speaking engagements, they're calling and calling. I think my calendar is already booked through July. And, uh, but I'm not going to drag the church everywhere. You can go if you want to go. I'm going to start going because there's too much on us. There's too much on us. And uh, Bishop Harmon said to me, Sproul, Sproul, when you're building this church, it was back in 1980, he said, can't drag the church everywhere. And he said, you wonder why they're not in Sunday school. <laughs> I said, okay. He said, people ain't got money. They got to do their laundry. They got kids to take care of. But you can't drag them everywhere. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I said, what good counts? I remember that. That was almost 35 years ago. <laughs> 35 years ago. I said, yes, Lord. Amen. So we want to be able to make sure that we can support our own. Amen. And to advance the kingdom of God. You're an amazing people, and you are an amazing church. If you believe that, say Amen. amen. If you have your Bibles, if you give me a few moments, and nothing. I have a great concern that's, uh, that's driving in my heart. I'm, this millennial piece is a, it's a big challenge for me. God is, he's challenging me personally concerning reaching them. And, um, and, uh, and I want to reach them without indictment because they're not doing anything wrong. Amen. But leading them directly to Christ um, will require a focus, Sister Lawanda, Sister Lucia, it's going to require a focus and a deliberate intent. So involving them in the work of the ministry, they're bright, they're smart, they're techie savvy, uh, they understand stuff I do not understand. I still can't understand Facebook, whether in, out box, cross box, I don't know what that stuff is. Yeah, that's why I don't touch it, because I'll be sending out stuff that ain't got no business going nowhere. <laughs> Yeah, I'm confused. <laughs> so I guess that makes me a little 
got that makes me a little something, something, but thank God for them. I got Sister Ebby, she'll help me. Amen. She said, no, Pastor, not like that. <laughs> Do it like this. Amen. So you'll pray for Pastor that God will continue to inspire us. Let's consider Paul's writing to the church at Rome. Here the theologians and scholars consider this one of Paul's most theological treaties uh, that relates to the early church. And he writes uh, with a particular focus and precision uh, about the law, about the spirit, about the church, about salvation. And he is particular preaching. Paul can be a very arduous task at times, um, but he is our majority writer of the New Testament scripture. Amen. And I want to encourage the congregation, um, those of us who are out of Bible study for those 60 minutes, I know how busy your life is, but I'm telling you the 60 minutes will change your life. Yeah, yeah. And um, we're living in a very different Christian time. And as a I guess seasoned pastor, I'm becoming concerned about what the future of the church could look like, Lady Tanya, unless there are some transformations and regenerations that happen in full. So I want to take a moment today and try to preach a little bit. Amen. And I trust that you'll pray for me. I feel very anointed today. Yeah, yeah I feel very anointed today. I was concerning uh, the Lord and myself, uh, Aunt Ro, about the shifting dynamics of sometimes that God causes in our life and sometimes we think that God anoints us for only one thing yeah. and the spirit spoke to me when I sat down in my chair he says I've anointed you for something else yeah sometimes we think that what we do is all that God wants us to do lay your hands on somebody and say God has anointed me for something else it doesn't mean that he has abandoned or lifted the anointing that he has already placed on your life. He means that I've anointed you for something else. He anoints us, if Elder Allen is right, is because we need help. He knows that what we're trying to do, we can't do unless he anoints us. He knows that we'll fail unless he injects himself into the process. So as you mature a little bit, Lady Terry, sometimes we, when we mature, we learn now not to even embrace it with the fullness, any assignment with the fullness of our human ability or prowess. We always look for the Lord to help us. Say, Lord, show me what to do. Show me how to do it. Show me how to handle uh, this situation. How should I respond? There's an anointing that helps us with that. Many times we keep running into this cyclical sort of, of, of contention is because we haven't asked God to help us. Yeah. Harvey keeps going around in a circle because we haven't asked God to help us. And I've learned now not to have expectation as a big part of my life. Yeah. I've learned not to expect much of anything from anybody, no matter what I do for them. Oh, that's a big idea. I'm learning to do stuff for people because I want to do it for them. Yeah, I'm learning to give to people because I want them to have what I'm giving them. And they don't give me nothing back. It's absolutely okay. I have no expectation of return because I believe that there's life in the sea. Oh, you're going to miss my message. I believe there's life in the sea. Yeah, if it doesn't come from you, it's coming from someplace else. Yeah. Because this reaping and sowing and harvest is significant to where we're going. It's, it's going to be important in this season, especially as a leading Pentecostal order, that our theology and our practice of worship be mature. Yeah, we dare not trend at this season of our life. I've never seen so many people get excited about being able to go to church with sneakers on. I ain't got to wear no tie, I can wear jeans, and they think that's exciting until hell break out. And then the sneakers don't matter, and you ain't got no fire and don't know how to pray. Yeah, we're getting caught in all kinds of things that don't matter. 
that will, won't help us at the very essence of what it means, amen, to mature in Christ. We must be able to lay hands on our own self, we're Barry, and command the devil to go. Yeah. Command sickness to go. Amen. Now the devil don't got us so we only get a cold and sick on Sunday. Yeah. <coughs> Can't make it. Today. <laughs> and Monday we're miraculously healed. <laughs> it's the trick of the enemy. It's the trick of the enemy. <coughs> but we cough Monday to Friday. We cough and sneeze until they kick us out the office. Oh, you're not hearing me here. All right. And God's saying, no, we need to be a mature order. And I'm almost finished preaching. A mature order that understands the assignment. Because the souls are coming, Sister Atterbury. Those that need to experience the authentic manifestation of God in spirit. That causes them to cry and not shout. Now, where they can't stop crying. Because of the spirit of conviction. Because the spirit of the, of, of the need for God to hand touch them and to handle them. Now, some of us have longings. We have things that need to happen five years from now. Yeah, that need to be on the altar right now. Yeah, we got stuff we need God to fix four years from now. That need to be on the altar right now. That's what we say. That's mature theology. So we're not caught in the vacuums of the moment. I can go to church without my jacket on. I can go to church and nobody's going to question me. And I, if I want to almost look like a woman today, nobody's going to say nothing to me and I'm a man. And all of those kind of crazy stuff. And I'm like, come on. The gospel's to help us work all that stuff out. That's what it's for. That's what it's for. Help us work through those things that are out of line with him. Oh, bless the name of God. Bless the name of God. You don't want it pacified. You want it challenged. You want to be challenged with, I want to be challenged with what's wrong with me. I want, the, I want the word of God. I want the Holy Ghost to challenge what's wrong with me. Make, me. make me restless until I deal with what's wrong with me. Yeah. Until I get hungry for deliverance. Until I get hungry for, for, to, to, to be what God would have me to be. Not somebody tell me it's all right to be wrong. It's a strong spirit of it's all right to be wrong in the church. And God said, no, no, I come to break the chain. I come to loose the bound. My God, I come to lift the heavy burden. I come to give you deliverance. Lift your right hand and say, God will deliver you. And I believe that the mission of this great church over these 90 years has been one of deliverance. One of standard. Amen. One that gives God the glory and gives people an authentic experience with him. And that's suggesting that no one else is. But that's the mission of this house. Amen. If you sit here long enough, you're going to have to get right. Or you're going to leave. Yeah. You're going to have to get right. I don't care how slow the turn is. As long as you turn it. <laughs> Y'all don't hear me here. <laughs> Sometimes the turn is real slow. But God give you enough to keep coming. I wish I had a witness here. So, so you keep going. I, I, I know you still jive, but you keep going. Keep going. He said, I'm going to get you straight after a while. God will get us straight. I wish I had a witness here. Yeah, God will get us straight. Romans chapter number two. As we do a careful read of this text. Verse number 11. And I'm going to read until it makes sense to me. For God does not show favoritism. Give me the New King James. NIV. Number 11, there we go. For God does not show favoritism. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. 
and all who sin under the law will be judged by the very same thing, the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteousness. Repeat after me and say, obedience matters, obedience matters. To, God. to God. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature, do by nature things required by the law, my God, they are a law for themselves, Ooh. even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their conscience, also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. Let's stop there. For a few moments, if you allow me to deal with this compounded idea, I want to talk with you from this idea. Look at someone and say, Lord, Lord. come on, call him like you need him to come. Say, Lord, Lord. Revive. revive convicted obedience, convicted obedience. in my heart. Revive convicted obedience in my heart. Unbridled carnality, Deacon Saunders, seems to interrupt what we should know of him as God. Oh, how the flesh wants to get away in pockets and in moments. And this is a very different time for the church. Our preordained elections and prosperities and, and progress and healing and wholesomeness seems to remain captive to circumstances and the cavities of the world with excuse. Somebody say, too long. Some of us have been doing the same thing over and over again, and we know better. Somebody say, too long. So I am convicted, I am convicted and censored in a great way, Elder Pat, um, that in this faith era uh, that seems to be uh, keep moving the goalposts, my conviction is arresting me concerning the church in practice. There is um, um, a vacillating faith uh, that has muddied the waters of our Christian witness, a faith that is moved by shifting trends uh, with attempt to redefine religious and scriptorial culture. So when we should be compelling men to come and realize the regenerating power of Christ and the Holy Ghost, this neo-Christian era um, the next generation is losing what I call scriptorial footing. So they are unfaithful. They are inconsistent. They're looking for something to excite them rather than change them. Well, well, there is a new um, carnality lurking among the church actually looking for another truth. God has set the truth in his word. God in this season is reminding us of that truth and authentic deliverance are inseparable. There is no deliverance without knowing the truth. And the Bible says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you it is the plan of the enemy to bind us, to 
uh, get us caught in pockets of cyclical uh, behavior that appears to be edifying at least to the experience but never to the soul. We find ourselves uh, excited about what we just experienced and we leave the same way we came in. My God, we were a liar when we came in and we're a liar when we walk out. We're a fornicator when we came in, we're a fornicator when we walk out. We're drunk when we came in, we're drunk when we walk out. Anybody that's been in the real experience with God, there's a challenge to the soul. If you have ever been in the Lord's presence, he will challenge what's wrong with you. He will bring you into compliance and in alignment to his divine will. He will call you out of that if you want to come out. My God, he will bring conviction about the very thing that tries to trap you and say, if you want to come out, I will bring you out. So we singing and jerking and and unchanged. So it's so important that you and I, who love the Lord God, can I preach? You're not going to rush me today. It's so important that you and I, who love God and believe God, we actually contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. This idea of living right. Living right. Yeah, living right. That's different for some of us. Yeah. Yeah. Because some of us are like the Gentiles that the scriptures have suggested. They didn't have a law, but found themselves by nature. Oh. Found themselves by nature complying to a law that wasn't even for them. Only because it was right. Look at somebody and say, I don't need the law. Somebody say it. I don't need the law to do what's right by you. It should be in your nature to do what's right. It should be in your nature to say, please forgive me. It should be in your nature to say, hello. It should, uh uh-oh. So salvation and the regenerated life is to be sealed with personal conviction for our salvific experience. We're going to shout today too, y'all. Paul speaks of the reprobated mind. Yeah, the lesser mind. The mind of willful wrongdoing. Uh, Beware, he says, of religion without consciousness. Beware of religion without conviction. Oh, my God. Beware of praise without the worthiness of his presence. Yeah. So even, and even as they did, the scripture says, not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobated mind to do those things which are not convenient. But unto the pure, all things, the Bible says, are pure. Yeah, don't go to sleep. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving in nothing pure. The devil will try to put you to sleep when you're preaching this kind of stuff. He'll try to make you sleepy. So if we were jerking and twerking and swinging and linging, you'd be wide awake. But anything that's going to touch the wrong of the soul, he want to make you sleepy. So wake up in here. So salvation and the regenerated life is to be sealed with personal conviction for our salvific experience. Paul speaks of this reprobated mind. He says, unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled, to them who are dirty and contaminated and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and consciousness 
<coughs> is defiled. They possess, profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. <laughs> With their mouth, I know God, but their behavior says, I'm the, I deny him. Yeah, they say that I'm saved, uh, but their life says that I deny him. They deny him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in this mulligan stew of neo-Christian idea, there's, there's a lot of talk about um, uh, and giving deflection to reasons to why I can do, say this, and do something else. And the scripture says just the opposite. It says uh, they possess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. But speak these things which become sound doctrine. Lay your hands on your neighbor, help me preach and say, um, um, speak these things which become sound doctrine. And that means as people of faith, people that belong to the body of Christ, we must be mindful of our conversations. Yeah, there's some things you don't want to talk about. Yeah, don't let the enemy make your ears itch. It's not worth the dialogue. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. Why? It doesn't become sound doctrine. Well, the, Christ, the Christian conscience actually suffers the need to be governed. Stay with me. Our redeemed consciousness. There is a consciousness and then there is a redeemed consciousness. Yeah, before I got saved, I had, I had a different kind of consciousness. After I got saved, I had another kind of consciousness. I wish I had a witness here. I'm trying to put it where you can eat it. Our redeemed consciousness needs biblical standard. It needs unwavering regard to the word of God for our lives. Many of us can justify the most abominable of behavior. Saved, sanctified, speaking in tongues, God has called me and justified the most abominable behavior. Oh, you're not hearing here because you won't allow your conscience to convict you. You know you're wrong and you deflect. You're dead up wrong. You know it and you kick your conscience back. Your conscience telling you, that ain't right. You shouldn't do that. Don't say that to your wife. That's not nice. Don't say that. Well, she did. There you go. You're not listening. She did. No, no, no. You're not listening to me. Holy Ghost will take you. are not listening. But this gives me the right. No, I told you, don't say it. Can I talk to two or three grown-up folk in here that have heard the Holy Ghost talk to you and say, don't say it. And you keep telling yourself why you can. I know. We're going to shout today. Not just, not just reverence for the rhetorical exercise, but for application to our actually daily life. Without convictions, our conscious thought is subject to the random interruption of carnal suggestion and impulse. If your consciousness is not redeemed, you will become a slave to your emotions. Your emotions will make you do and say anything. Speaking in tongues. Look at your neighbor and say, I can't do everything I feel. I can't say everything that comes to my mind. And if I let the Holy Ghost work in me, my conscience will stop me. I'm concerned about an emerging church without consciousness. Oh, this is not an ABC message. No, I ain't hooping yet. Not yet. I'm going to hoop, but I ain't hooping yet. 
Oh, bless the name of God. Our consciousness needs to be revived in the scripture. And the reason why? Because half of us don't subject ourselves to the teaching of the Holy Scripture. That's why you stay out of Bible study. That's why you don't read the word of God. Because you don't want to be constrained in your conscience. Preach man of God. You can open your Bible and the Lord will give you a scripture to knock you in your forehead without even looking for it. So consciousness, what is this thing? Brother O, it's variously understood as our inner moral sense of what is right and what is wrong. It is the internal governor of the soul. The redeemed consciousness runs even deeper. It is an inner moral sense of what is right and wrong in Christ based upon the word of God post our conversion. Please let me make the distinction. There are people who are not saved, who are not redeemed, who are good people. Sometimes they're better than some of us saved people. Because they got high standards of consciousness. Y'all not hearing me here? Their mama taught them good. Oh, y'all not Mama taught them what was right, what was wrong. You don't talk to, the, you don't cuss at people. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. They didn't have to get saved to do that. Somebody taught them what was right and what was wrong. We got a church emerging that's trying to say that everything is right and nothing is wrong. Well, I come with a word from the Lord. I come to let you know that God sets the standard. So without post-conversion convictions, post-conversion convictions, therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, all things are passed away, behold all things become new, and that is usually sealed with Holy Ghost post-conversion convictions. Yeah. You remember pastor, right, when God say? There were some things that we were immediately convicted about. Immediately. Immediately. There's some things, if I do this, I'm backsliding. Some of y'all remember when you first got saved? You had conviction about certain things. Now, what's happened now is that convictions have become a group ideology. We try to suggest that my convictions are part of this conglomerate idea. No, 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 uh, no, 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 no. Samson had a conviction, and he should not, by vow, cut his hair, touch anything that was dead, should stay away from anything that comes from the vine. Yeah. Everybody else could get drunk. Samson couldn't. Everybody else could go to the barber shop. Samson had a conviction. Oh, you're not hearing me here. And what happens is that once you start breaking your convictions, they will eventually find you. You so you remember when we picked up the, uh, 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 the jaw of the ass? Yeah, uh, well, look and say, one conviction broken. He, shouldn't, he won the victory too. He did. Yeah, he won the victory uh, by breaking his convictions. Oh, you're not hearing me here. Am, am I too heavy here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He won. He still won, but the conviction was broken. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. But he held on to that hair as long as he could. Oh, you're not hearing me good. You're not hearing me good. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You have to watch your own convictions. When God convicts you about something that doesn't apply, that doesn't apply to Elder here. It doesn't apply to him. It applies to you. When God convicts you, stop comparing your conviction about to Sister Danielle. Look at somebody say, it's mine. I'm not hearing y'all. Somebody say, it's mine. 
This is my conviction. I don't care what you do. God told me I can't do this. This has made a mess of the church. The church is a mess. We're not convicted about anything. That's why we stay home with no conviction. I can't even go on vacation on Sunday without being convicted. I'm on the beach in Mexico, nobody speak English, and I get to talking about, I wonder if I can go to church today. Because I got a conv- oh, you're not hearing me. So, without post conversion conviction, we are subject to mental and behave- behavioral aimlessness. Without a God conviction, we can be driven by almost anything. Here's my revelation. This is for this most important generation that God has created in the earth. This is what's wrong. God gave me this revelation. He says, this is what's wrong with the millennials. They have no convictions. So they are subject, you're not hearing me here, to be driven by anything. So we must pray for this generation. This is why they can't receive conversion in fullness. They only go but so far and stop. Because the next step is you got to say no to something. (laughs) All right, I'm not picking on them. I, lo- I want them to be, I want them here. I want, I want them here, but not by the means of alternative behavior. They're going to have to get saved just like I did. Just like you did, they got to get saved. You remember when God saved you? I know you're young and you're hot and you're cute and you, you, know, you want to do this, you want to do that. I did too. I did too, but conviction got me somewhere. And I begin to love God more than what I wanted. Oh. So this redeemed consciousness is where our faith convictions and our beliefs are actually formed. You're not born with these convictions. They're created. They're taught in you. They become the parameters of our way of life. Yeah, they become parameters of our way of life. They become the foundation of our personal ethos. Yeah. Each and every one of us have a personal way of life. Okay, where you come from, what country you come from, when you have a personal ethos. When God saves us and converts us, he, he doesn't dismiss your ethos. He gets in the middle of it. He joins what you already are and dismisses what's not like him. We need to let And he does that by the way of conscious conviction. He'll convict you about things in your ethos that is not actually pleasing to him. So he makes you uncomfortable about sleeping with her. I've married a lot of people on Sunday morning. All right. I'm not just talking. I married a whole bunch of folk on Sunday morning. Come here shacking. I said, man, we're going to give you a wedding. You're ready to stop shacking? (laughs) Yeah. Because they become convicted. It's not that they're doing what I say. They become convicted. 
They've been shacking all this long. Maybe they kept on shacking. But something couldn't... Oh, you're not hearing me here. You're put, I'm not in your business. God did that. I didn't do it. He made you want to get married. Oh, y'all not hearing me up in here. Oh, my God. Oh my. We push back from this idea of that someone should have a higher order of interpretation of the scripture as it relates to the application for our lives. It's our consciousness and our convictions before him that causes us to want to change. If not, church just becomes a big theatrical session where we sing and jump up and down. So these parameters become the foundation of our personal ethos. These convictions actually dictate, Sullivan, our worldview. Without them, there is always a probability of unexplained confusion. These convictions keep us in a certain parameter of God's will. And any time the Lord, the enemy starts coming against your convictions, you need to pray. Many times you start feeling like it's okay to do stuff that God took from you. You need to pray. You're getting ready to enter into a world of darkness and confusion. Yeah. And this is personal. This is not all day traditional. They this, they got all this old concrete. The devil tricking all of y'all with that nonsense. No, this is about you and how God has convicted you about you. Because everybody ain't got the same struggles that you have. Everybody here ain't worrying about fornication. They got that wrapped already. Maybe somebody else. Maybe something else with you. So we deflect it to the church. Make it too hard to come to church. Get all kind of here more than I'm it too hard to come to church. Either you love God or you don't. They don't love enough. Well, you love God. Come on up here and show everybody how to love. Stop all that noise. That's noise. <laughs> Deflections. Not me, just as long as it's somebody else. We put up mirrors. We find that we have our worldview changing. So the redeemed consciousness, and I must quit. I've got more, but I'm going to stop. Uh, the redeemed consciousness is important to our worship. It bridges and provides direction for our Christian behavior in relationship to truth. I need to work this a minute. For our life in law. It is there where we are motivated to give God glory by the acceptance of truth. Of truth. How do I say this without being indicting? This idea that you can bury yourself in dysfunctional behavior Override your consciousness and make what the word of God says not true just so that you can keep being a demon. <laughs> you need deliverance. Be careful of people who are always blaming somebody else. Most time, the stuff that's crazy in my life, I did it. If I didn't do it, I allowed it. Always blaming somebody else. If they wouldn't have did that, I wouldn't have. You do what's right. But she said this to me, and I'm saying, you do what's right. Now we have a church that doesn't know how to apologize. All right, that's where I'm going with it. 
We don't know how to reconcile. Somebody say, preach, man of God, preach. And then we want to know why our marriages are upside down. Because you don't know how to reconcile. You can't reconcile with God. You can't reconcile with her. You can't humble yourself before him. How are you going to hum humble yourself before her? Then your house becomes a, a mess. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And this is grown up stuff. Because there's this whole big thing, we got a, we got a whole, we got this whole movement now of this excitement. About, I get excited about getting victory over the devil in my life. That excites me. My God, when I have fought for the last six months and God gives me the victory. When the devil thought he had me and I slipped away. That excites me when God gives me favor. When they know that I don't have enough energy or ability to make it up. Oh, I get excited. All this manufactured joy. When you got joy, you ain't got to manufacture it. Because if you got the joy of the Lord, you're not weak. I don't care how bad the dog fight is. When you got the joy of the Lord, you got strength. When you got the joy of the Lord, the devil can fight all he want to fight. You're talking about, I got enough strength to go the distance. God keeps renewing my strength because they that way upon the law. I know he will renew my strength. So I'm not scared of your fight. Let's fight. But I will be like a tree planted by the river of water. And I, I will be moved. Come on, hit yourself and say, my conviction is my conviction. Call me whatever names you want to call me. Old fashioned, brown noser, call me whatever you want. It's my conviction. And until the Holy Ghost releases me, you got to get up from around me. There is a need, and I close in these last three moments, for the revival of conviction. Sister Crystal, we're living in a church era that has lost convictions. We'll call ourselves saved. We've been redeemed. We're full of the Holy Ghost. And somebody can push you to the brink. And you will cuss them all the way out. <laughs> this has become a Christian norm. You're laughing because you'll know I got it. and mean every word you say. You've been saved long enough to know you should, you should have forgot how to cuss. You can't get me that mad. Oh, all right. We've lost conviction about how we present ourselves before the Lord. That's what all this dressed down church stuff is about. We need some convictions. 
We have lost convictions about alcohol. We've lost our convictions about cigarettes, preaching, smoking, and drinking, all at the same time. It is what it is. It is what it is. My God, it is what it is. It is what it is. But my God, I don't know if I could go back to doing that and keep preaching. I hope there's still enough. In, oh, y'all not hearing me. And I ain't preaching about nobody. I'm preaching about this idea of conviction. Where has our convictions gone? Do anything to anybody? Come into church, sleep with this one. Turn around, sleep with a cousin. Turn around and try to go out with this one. No convictions. It makes the church a circus. You know you in that deacon face too long. Respect his wife. Have some convictions. I don't care how cute he is. I don't care how good you think he is. He is not yours. Oh, y'all not liking me here. He does not belong to you. Elder Woodbury single, talk to him. No, you don't want to talk to him. Want to talk to somebody that got somebody. All tied up in covenant. All wrapped up in covenant. Oh, hard-working man. You're not hearing me. Got a few dollars. You're going to survive some stuff. You're not hearing me here. You're not understanding me here. Want something that belongs to somebody. Where are your convictions? Am I preaching right? Yeah. They're going to come up in the church and try to say, the church shouldn't be saying that. Where do we get that noise from? It's noise. Then you get mad when the church mother check you. Now, little honey, you stay out of his face. See, Mother Bruinton. She said, Ellis Brewer, I done got too old now, I'm about 90. But I want you to know that Mother Sterling ain't as old as Mother Bruinton. She ain't scared of you. You can try to hurt her feelings, she's gonna keep on rolling. Okay. Let me close here. I'm late, I'm long. Maybe I can finish this next Sunday. There is a need for the revival of conviction. It's important that we stop trying to make the church and community comply to our dysfunctional and unscriptorial understandings of life. Church is not a place for games. I got a little piece in here where I want to talk about preaching the gospel. Good news. Yeah. Maybe next time. So without convictions in the Holy Ghost, there will be what I call open portals, Deacon Barry, in our soul. Convictions are like Centurion soldiers guarding the doors of our soul. Yeah. Leaving our faith to actually being overrun by flesh. The 
preaching of the gospel is essential to authentic transformation. It is gospel preaching that compels personal conviction to salvation. You can't get saved without the preaching of the gospel. If Paul got this right. Yeah. It takes preaching to start that process. And a lot of what we call in preaching today. Yeah. Paul says that, what, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Preaching is the power of God unto salvation. Preaching is the power of God unto salvation. This theatrics is a trick of the devil. We rhyming and got all kinds of acronyms and say, man, where's the gospel? I got stuff going on. Preach the gospel to me, man. Preach the gospel to me. Mess me up, will you? Mess me up. For in it, the scripture says, the righteousness of God is revealed. In the preaching of the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And this is why God protects the preacher. Okay, I'm going somewhere with that. He said, no, no, don't nobody handle him or her. This is why he protects him. He said, if he's going he gonna to get a spanking, I'm going to spank him. But whatever you do, you better keep your hands and your mouth off him. He says, from faith to faith. He says, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. True conviction is realized by the exposure to truth and the acknowledgement of the reality of the same. It brands a truth in our consciousness and persuades conviction in our experience. And the reason why some of y'all ain't stopped drinking yet, the reason why some of y'all, y'all been, been in the church and saved too long, too long, and still wrestling with that. And God has already convicted you. How do you know, Pastor? Because he convicted me. <sighs> you ain't the only person who got a tobacco habit. He'll take it from you. Don't believe me, ask Sister Millie. He'll take it from you. It's a struggle, but he'll take it from you. I'm preaching I am. Tell me you're getting too personal. Y'all get over it. Get over it. He'll take it from you. The reason why he hasn't taken it from you is because you don't want to get rid of it. The reason why you're still trying to get some table wine Let me tell you what they told me. Wine is wine is wine is wine. All of it will get you tipsy. When conviction sets in, even if you fall to it, conviction wears you out about it. It is there where our personal values and our ethics in Christ are actually formed. Lay your hands on the body, help the pastor preach because I'm done. Help the pastor preach and say, we need some convictions. I got a little piece on here in here about the difference between rules and principles. 
the enemy is trying to reduce the church to a bunch of rules. Amen. Ain't about no rules. Amen. And I know there's nothing wrong with going to the movies, but I still get convicted about the idea. Amen. So I don't go. Like Samson's hair. That's my conviction. Sister Cal don't even ask me to go. Nice little night, night out for 60 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> I know the movie ain't gonna send nobody to hell. But I still got a conviction. As long as I got a conviction, I ain't going. I just got transparent for you. You'll stop dumping your convictions. Because everybody else is okay with everybody else. Yeah. It started with the, the jaw of the ass. It cost Samson his eyes. He was invincible. He was undefeatable. Until he started messing with his convictions. You're not hearing me. God knows I'm preaching good. You need some convictions. We all need some conviction. True persuasion and convictions in principles are formed at the judgment seat of our consciousness. It is there where our personal values and ethics are formed. We must be people that will judge ourselves. I'm going to stop here because it's going to be 2 o'clock. That's what your consciousness is for. It's self-judgment. I'm telling you, you want to judge yourself. You don't want God to judge you. That's what he gave you a conscience for. And when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, oh, you're not hearing me here. The Holy Ghost and your consciousness, they partner up. Yeah. Stop judging your own self. Stop making yourself okay when you know you're a mess. You know you mean. You know you mean. You know you're not nice. You know you're tricky. You know it. What you do is you put yourself somebody who's a, put yourself close to somebody who's a little trickier than you. I'm not really tricky. She tricky. I'm preaching that for you. Oh, you're tricky. Look at the mind said, judge yourself with your tricky self. Your consciousness is for judging yourself. Crossing your leg ain't going to make it less tricky. <laughs> Sitting back and trying to intellectualize this thing ain't going to stop the Holy Ghost from messing with your consciousness. Closing. Convictions become a driving force for the motivations of our actions. When you have convictions, and you're a person who has convictions, you can almost predict people's response. You can't convince me that Mother Hyman cussed you out. That ain't gonna never happen in this lifetime. You just straight up lying. You don't know, Pastor. You don't know. You should have heard you lying. Are, are you getting my point? I want you to stream, but I want you to get my point. Convictions makes your behavior predictable. 
As long as you let yourself get away with doing crazy stuff, the devil will drive you insane with it. So they are beliefs. They're your beliefs. These are your personal verdicts about yourself. Don't deflect them on somebody else. Stop, Sproul, standing where you are. Yeah. Oh, how the Lord wants us to mature. There are a sea of people that's waiting for the anointing that has historically rest upon this house and continues to rest here. So I don't care what your struggle is. And God does, is not overly concerned about your struggle as long as you're willing to wrestle with your struggle. But what we can't let happen is this deflecting of struggle. Stop trying to tell me I got to tell you you okay when you're not. You're not okay. That's what the altar is for. For us to deal with these things that are not okay. And anytime you're blaming someone else for where you are, you've already missed the point. And they may be guilty of the very thing that you're saying, but the struggle really is with you. I've learned, especially for married folk, that we love to get into that deflection thing. And we make the deficiency in the other the reason why we do what we do. That's what married people do. When the truth of the matter is that in marriage, there's really almost 99% of the time, it's impossible for it to be one person's fault. Usually, 99% of the time. Because the influence that we have on each other in covenant, if we would have stopped it when we should have, talking to married people now, we know how to shut stuff down. If you're going to indict something, indict yourself for not shutting it down. Oh, boy, I done hit a nerve now. It happened, but you saw it coming. Very rarely does it surprise you. But you kept going on. Shut it down. Bring it to the place of reconciliation. Let truth find her perfect works here. Let's get this straight right now. Before this gets into an area, I don't care if y'all don't like me today, I don't care. Let's get this right now, because this is going to go somewhere we ain't going to come back. Let's flush this up right now. I'm not looking for perfection, I'm just looking for truth. I can handle it from there. Boo-boo, I love you, been, been here too long, too late to be doing anything else. All right, so we ain't going to get into all of that, but we're not going to do this. Y'all not hearing me, we're not going to do this. Anytime you made up your mind, it's okay to do this. It won't be long. Touch the mind and say, stop the foolishness. The Lord spoke to you long ago. Especially if you saved and sanctified and got the Holy Ghost. He spoke to you long ago. He don't let stuff like that creep up on you. He'll whisper in your sleep, give you a dream. He'll do anything to make you get it. We get up and act like, oh, we was the collard greens. No, it won't. I was God trying to tell you. And if you're spiritual enough, if you're grown up enough, you go like, God, I hear you. Then you start looking for it. That's right. Say it. The word of God has come to help us today. And it's my prayer that as we get ready for this millennial fire for these that are coming who are broken 
messed up. They just want some place to belong where they can work out their soul salvation. Tell somebody, this next move is not about us. Look at somebody and say, I was them 10 years ago. Now look at me. Yeah. God just moves us along, doesn't he? He just moves us along. Yeah. I trust you will receive what the Lord has given to the pastor for you today. God does not have or show favoritism. Pastor, why are you pushing so hard? Because there are elections that God wants to wake up in this house. There are assignments, Lady Cruz, that God wants to give his choice people. He has been careful with you. He has brought you to a place of decision where you have to say, yes, I will, or God, no, I won't. He's calling us. He's calling us. We played the game too long, Deke. He's calling us. I make this appeal with great expectation. You know how I mean, the, the Lord told me that in this season that I need to walk in the distinction of my anointing. I think I'm a pretty humble guy. I'm a lot of things, you know, but I ain't gonna hurt nobody. He says, in this season, I'm depending on you to walk in the distinction of your anointing. He says, I've given you a distinct message. He says, I've given you the ability to empower others. Yeah. He says, no seeds that have been planted, it's time for them to give birth. It's time for them to give birth. So state lady, I've had the joy of, of watching you and your sister live these lives that are just absolutely glorify God. You've taught a generation how to live this kind of life that pleases God and be happy. When I see you, I see no excuses. Good God help me. And for that journey, God has a recompense reward. All right. All right. Sometimes the sacrifice, the cost of it seems heavier than we would like to bear. But God does not show favoritism. Somebody say, God is fair. God is fair. And the just shall live by their faith. And with such a tenacity, sometimes they have to be worthy. Sometimes they're not worthy enough. That went over some of y'all's head. Sometimes they're not worthy enough. It becomes one of those pocket moments. When you get caught in the satisfaction of the moment and the future becomes a burden. God said the price tag is bigger than that. Trust me. So we're getting ready. Lady DeBar, we're getting ready. I'm excited about the souls that will be saved. Pray that you will help me build this infrastructure. 
leadership and commitment. We're going to stop being whatever we're being right now. And we're going to pull ourselves together and do what we know how to do. Yes, sir. Ella Pat can do that next Sunday. He can do that the following Sunday. That's not luck. That's experience. And then there's some experiences that ain't been displayed yet. Right, Elder Woodbury? Platform ain't there yet. God is getting us ready. But the enemy wants us to devalue what he's given us. We're going to have a harvest of a generation that figures out that they can live a life of conviction for the Lord. That they can do it. And that God's going to give them the means to do it. So Nozia, don't you stop believing God. It will come to pass. It will. Somebody say, without compromise. God ain't asking you to be a nun or a priest. He's just asking you to be obedient. And our obedience will bring us success. Men of God, I've heard the word of the Lord. I need to come from the balcony. I need to come from wherever I am. Because I need to present this invitation to you. And this is the most significant time of the service. Because this is where the invitation is. It's not the preaching. It's the invitation after the preaching. God, I want to be more. I need to be what you have called me to be. God, I need to recapture my convictions. And I'm coming. I'm coming. Lord, I need to come. I don't have any intentions on singing you through. Because some of you are convicted right now. And you're doing what you always do with conviction. The Spirit of the Lord is telling you in your conscience right now, if you go, move, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. I expose today the strategy of the enemy in our mind. I took my time to expose the strategy of the enemy in our minds. God, I know you have more for me. You've blessed me. I've got more than most. Why am I miserable? So, I don't want to play with you. I, don't want, I want to be what you have anointed and elected me to be. I'm coming. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost tugging on you. After hearing the word, it should be easy to walk. Not to me, but to him. God said, if you take this step, I'm going to meet you. I'm going to meet you at the place of your struggle. Man of God, I'm coming. Not enough money is going to satisfy this, y'all. Security and lack of physical want is not going to satisfy this. God, I need convictions to be restored in my heart. I need conviction to fight all night if I got to. There are five more of you coming. You need to come. Talk about, I can do this in my, in my seat. God said, get up and come.
to come to the place of sacrifice. One more time, Brother Gary. I want to change you. God, help me get beyond the past. Restore my convictions. Lord, I want them back. When I was really concerned about offending you, Yes, I'm crying. Yes! 
Yes, why? Why won't I? Renew it, renew it, renew it, renew it. Yes, I'm crying. Savior, 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 Savior. Man of God. Man of God. Yeah, yeah, here. Come on. Give God the praise, will you? It's why. Somebody pray. Somebody pray. Somebody pray. They're weeping at the altar. Somebody pray. Oh. Give me patience. God, I know you will. I know you will. Father, give me patience. Yeah. Oh. A good woman. For this season. A fresh application. Of her discipline. Yes. Be glorified. Be glorified. Be glorified in it. Yeah. And it is so. And it is so. Why, why, why? God, revive my conviction. Revive my conviction. Lord, I'm pressing forward. Yes, I'm crying. Lord, I leave it here. God a radical praise. We need an exhausting praise. Oh, yeah! Come on, praise him. Praise him. Praise the Lord. Open your mouth with praise. Lift your voice. Use your voice. And give God praise. God, I thank you for this. Oh, God. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, we're going to leave it right here. I won't take it back home. I'm going to leave it right here. I'm going to leave it right here. Yeah, 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 yeah.
Lord, I choose your way. Realign me. Realign me. Realign me in your will. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. Give him a dance back. Give him a dance back. Give him a fire back. Give it back to me. Lord, give me a reason. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Let me dance again. Let me praise again. You're breaking anointing. Yeah, 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 yeah. My conviction. God, let me work it out. Let me work it out. Let, let me, let me work it out, God. Let me work it out. Can't get away from it. Let me praise you with freedom. Thank you for the touch. Thank you. Thank you. The wheel and the tear. Let it come up together at the time of harvest. He says, I'll do the separate. Get my heart right. Father, we thank you for victory right now. <laughs> right here, I've cast it all my care of the punk. Leaving it right here. Leaving it right here. I refuse to take it home. I refuse to take it home. God, I refuse to take it home. God, I beg you. Take it from me. Woo! Take it from me. Thank you for freedom. Thank you for freedom. Thank you for freedom.
Talk to him, D. Talk to him. The Lord has taken it from you. Don't you dare bring it home. Lord, I thank you now. Lord, I thank you right now. Lord, I thank you right now. And we count it done. Gilmore God doing it right now. Wave your hand and say, I've got the victory. And it is so. In Jesus' name. Thank God. And amen. And amen. Then the Lord renews your strength. The Lord heals your system. Shout it of the Lord. And God renews you. Somebody shout life. The devil is alive.
I hear the war cry, I hear the war cry. The devil is a liar. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah! Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Come on, together, together. Yeah, yeah.
Nation. We will perfect our praise. We will have team praise. Shout, I got my conviction back. Let me tell you something about conviction. And I'm gonna receive this offer. Let me tell you something about conviction. Conviction doesn't always mean abstaining from something or you can't have it. Sometimes me and God said, that's the wrong way to do it. He said, if you're going to do it, do it the right way. Look what I say, if I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do it the right way. Because our text said that it is the obedience, not the talk of obedience, but the act of obedience that declares righteousness. So it ain't what I say. It's not to say, it's what I do. If you know that's true, clap your hands real fast and give God a prayer. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody shout out that conviction. So, Gilmo, we can't be saved without conviction. I'm glad I got conviction. I'm still struggling with the movements. Elder Pat go all the time. It don't be more bother him than the man on the moon. I'm still struggling with the movements. I'm trying to make it pragmatic for you. It don't mess him up. I go, I can lose my anointing. Don't miss me. But God said, I took that from you once. I'm making it like that because this ain't about the movies. Y'all don't get me wrong. Somebody say, oh, it's about my obedience. Mr. Deborah, I'm still learning how to obey him. Boy, is that tough sometimes. Whew. All right. Anybody here, God? Anybody here? We here. Oh, this is Pentecostal time. Anybody here, God, today? If you heard God, somebody say amen. There are 20 of us that will share $100, I heard the Lord say. I'm the first one. He's the second one. I heard 20. Don't, do, don't sit down, keep the prayers going, because if you ain't going to give it, I'm not going to pull it out of you. I ain't got time for that today. 
Look at somebody and say, we all grown up. Yeah, I heard the Lord say 20. Tim, you need to sow $100 if I got to give it to you. Where are you? 20. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I heard 20. I think I'm at 7. 8. 9. I'm at 10. 11. 12. Watch God do it. Somebody say release. Watch God do it. Somebody say this week. Somebody say it loud. This week. Hey. That's 12. Thirteen. Fourteen. Ah, yeah, she Fifteen. There's five more. Sixteen. Seventeen. There's some things you and Elder Troy need to get on the altar now for five years from now. It's going to be bigger than you think. Get it on the altar right now. Where am I at? 17? 17? All right, I'm done. 17? Oh. 17? 18? Thank you, thank you. 19? Oh. to say watch the numbers go down Sometimes you got to pray because you need things to happen. And I'm always reminded Moses, when God was going to kill everybody, you know God will kill you? That's what the scripture says. God will kill you. He was going to kill everybody. And Moses said, God, but your reputation. I wish I had a couple. If you ever get the Bible study, you ever get this. He said, but your reputation. He said, God, what will they say? Oh, y'all, what are the heathens going to say 
if you kill us and don't deliver us. You brought us out. He said, don't kill us. Oh, y'all not hearing me here. Look at somebody and say, God's got a reputation. <laughs> Come on, stand with your greatest seed in your hand. I want you to walk to the altar. Don't send it, I want you to walk it. Hallelujah. Stand, whatever you pledge, whatever you're doing, just stand. Stand straight up and we're going home. Yes, sir. God can fix it. Somebody shout, God can fix it. Yes, sir. Woo. Can you, can, can you ever feel the pressure of warfare when it's pressing against you? And that's there to actually try to get you to stop. What you can't do is stop. You got a call on Sunday, get up. Where you going? I'm going to the house of the Lord. Sniffling and all. Don't let them stop you. So Marquis to God getting ready to turn your whole situation around. Know what to do with the turnaround. He's going to make it so you can be the best mother you could ever think of. All you got to do is watch the favor around you already. You're looking right at favor in case you didn't know what it was. You're looking at favor. God's blessing your family. Oh, all right. All right. We're going home. God's blessing your family. And be happy. Be happy. Even if it ain't everything you wanted to be right now, say, God, I thank you for blessing my family. Oh, my God, my God, my God. It's better than it was. All right, somebody come take this microphone for me. Come on, Elvis. I'm going home. Hallelujah. Somebody said, God, thank you for reviving my conviction. Whoever number 20 was, who, who, who was number 20? Brother Darrell was number 20. to mind. You gotta stay. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what we have heard. We thank you for the blessing that you have poured upon our lives. We thank you for coming into our service on today healing, delivering, and setting free. Now, God, we're asking that you build a fence around us, that we can keep this word all week long. In Jesus' name, amen.